If you change your mind, you change your life, just change your mind. The Lord loves you. He's standing with his arms wide open for you. Oh, 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 oh. Be encouraged, cause this day's for you. Don't you let this opportunity pass by. Good evening, family, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Thank you for allowing me into your homes. I hope you will let this word uh, penetrate your heart. God has really been dealing with us in this series, hasn't he? Really confronting us and giving us an opportunity, which I'm so grateful for, an opportunity to become healthier. And in order for us to become healthy, we've got to look at some stuff, deal with some stuff that doesn't feel real good. But the pain isn't forever. The discomfort isn't forever. But once we go through that thing, it reminds me of the scripture that says your present suffering isn't worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed after this. So we're going to try to get to this after this part of this. But this this past Sunday, we we're still in a series overcoming your losses. And we talked from the subject. I can accept this. I got tremendous feedback from you on this. Uh, quite a few folks reached out and um, I think it, I think it touched quite a few people. I know it touched me. It gave me some answers. It really started to make some sense of some stuff for me. And so let's pray, and we're going to get into this tonight, try to break it down even further for you, okay? Father, we thank you so much for being such a good and gracious God, a God who always desires to draw near us, to give us answers, not to just make the hair stand up on the backs of our necks, but to give us answers so we can stand up in our lives. Thank you for being a God that desires to do a work into completion, to get us to a place of wholeness, a place of satisfaction, a place of fulfillment. Holy Spirit, I need your help always. Help me to be an, a, a, a good partner with you tonight as we help others to hear your heart. Help me to hear your heart, that we might grow just a little bit more. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's look at the scripture so we can get to the meat of this. Well, the scripture is the meat too, so please don't hear it that way. <laughs> let's talk about uh, 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter and the 16th verse. And it says, David therefore inquired of the Lord for the child, and David fasted and went and lay all night on the ground. The elders of, the ho of his household stood beside him in order to raise him up from the ground, but he was unwilling and would not eat food with him. Then it happened on the seventh day that the child died and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, behold, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him and he did not listen to our voice. How then can we tell him that the child is dead since he might do himself harm? But when David saw that the servants were whispering together, David perceived that the child was dead. So David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes. And he came into the house of the Lord, and he worshipped. Then he came into his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this thing that you have done? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. And David said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he has died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. And verse 24 says, Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her. And she gave birth to a son, and he named him Solomon. Now the Lord loved him. They were amazed at David's reaction when David finally received word that the child was dead, which is where we really get our, our, our title from. I can accept that. While we're trying to take full advantage of this gift of grief, there's a place that we have to get to that we kept drilling in Sunday and going to drill in some more. God is trying to get us to this place of acceptance. Now, 
Here's what often happens when, when we even hear that or even think about it. We don't normally hear acceptance, we hear defeat. And, and, and if you got a tenacious bone in your body, as we talked about Sunday, you don't want to let go of stuff when the outcome ain't what you want it to be. I, I know I'm that way. I've held on to stuff way far longer than I should have, and I know you have too. And that's, that's the point we're trying to make with this portion of our studies. There comes a time when God needs you to let some stuff go. And you have to accept it for what it is. The old notion of it is what it is. And sometimes that's so hard for, for, for take charge kind of people, go getter kind of people, resilient kind of people, because sometimes we can tell ourselves that if I just run a little harder, if I just push a little longer, if I beg, if I plead, if I just fight, you know, I don't want to quit too early because because the next if I, I might quit right before I was about to get my breakthrough. And th there are some instances, y'all, where that's true. But as we spoke several weeks ago, we got to start using this thing called discernment. But we really start to talk to the Lord about show me how I should approach this thing. Holy Spirit, lead me in how I should approach this thing. And through that gift, you have to ask the Holy Spirit, is this something worth fighting for? That just what just popped in my mind was the scene when 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 um, David and his men lived in Ziglag and they they went out to do battle with the uh, Philistines and they sent them back and they got back to Ziglag and they found out that the Malachites had had raided their village and taken the people hostage. And David asked the Lord the question. Should I go after it? That that just hit me like a ton of bricks because. You know, if it were me and, and probably if it were you, I don't even think we'd stop to ask God that. If you got my people, I'm going to get them. But David in his dependency on God said, should I go? Should I go? Will I recover? God said, go and you will recover all. We have to get in the habit of asking God, is this thing right here? worth me fighting for. Not the people, because they got all these ideas and suggestions with very little information. <laughs> they only know partial part, they only know the story partially. God knows the whole thing. God, is this something I should fight for? And one of the points I wanted to drive home with you, and I want to drive it again tonight, the fact that you can get to this place of acceptance does not mean that you are in agreement with the results, that you're OK with the results. Acceptance is not agreement, not agreement with the results. It's an agreement with God, but I'm not good with the results, which means I still I'm still going to have to go through some pain. We're going to touch on that in just a minute. I got to go through some stuff because I have to realize that my reality has won. This thing is real. This is exactly what has happened. We have to know when to accept it. But here's the good news. I want you to understand that accepting the moment, accepting this loss, does not mean that you surrender your pursuit of righteousness. You are still going to become who God said you are. And see, here's why we need to accept, because the things that we don't accept hold us up. And you and I got a limited amount of time. We don't know the day or the hour when we're going to when God's going to going to call us home. And, 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 and if we're honest with ourselves, well, let me just ask you this question. How many years, how many years do you think you have have given over to things that you should have accepted? Watch this so that God could get you to this place of adjustment. Because that, that, that's what he's trying to do. Accept because God's going to adjust your course, but still get you back on course. But the problem is, if I'm still fighting for things that I should accept, I'm exhausting time. And I'm exhausting me. And I'm hurting me. One of the things that I pressed in on is, is, is 
this notion here that um, whenever, well, loss is painful. It is. That's why grief is necessary. But whenever we try to hold on to, to things longer than, they sh than we should, we end up turning that pain into suffering. That pain into suffering. Let me just look at my notes and just read this. It says here, but if you don't allow the process of grief to take you through those emotions, you resisting this process will turn your pain into suffering. Suffering occurs when you take pain and you stretch it because you're trying to ignore, you're trying to suppress, you're trying to deny your reality. Instead of just getting to a place where you realize this is beyond me. And that's, that's the understanding behind accepting. When you have to come to grips with this thing right here is beyond my ability to control the outcome. Let me say that again. This thing here, this loss, this thing I'm going through, it is beyond my ability to control the outcome. What are examples of that? Here it is. You cannot control what other people do. Which is why when we think about loss, nine times out of ten, it's relational. Somehow, somewhere, some people play a role in this. And, and, and the loss is being perpetrated by a lack of agreement, some disconnection, host of other things where you wish somebody would do something differently so that this thing does not have to result in a loss. But here's the reality. You cannot control what other people do. Can't control what they think. You can't. How do I know? Because God doesn't even let himself do that. If God won't control you, you can't control somebody. Try to manipulate, but that's sin. Try to do little things to coerce people. That's wrong. It's going to result in, in the relationship uh, still dying anyway, just dying slower. You go from pain to suffering because now you got to stretch it out a little bit. But people get to do what they want to do, y'all. Haven't you learned that by now? And it ain't always in a good spirit. It ain't always to the best, to your best interest. It's not. But another thing you can't control is, is what God decides to do. You can't. It's beyond your control. And so you got to recognize that, that this thing I'm trying to salvage, this thing I'm trying to hold on to, the outcome is beyond my control. And so I got to go. I can accept that without surrendering your pursuit of righteousness. Righteousness meaning to be who you ought to be. I am still going to become who I have been predestined to be despite this loss. Because if I can accept what has to be accepted, God has a plan of adjustment for you. He's still determined to get you. Scripture tells you that he's determined to get you to your expected end. But my question to you, are you holding him up because you're still somewhere not willing to accept something? So we're going to talk about that. Had a lot of feedback from you guys on uh, the graph that we showed you. So we're going to put it back up tonight. And I want you to see what happens. The stuff we have to go through to get to this place of adjustment the stuff that acceptance holds up. I'm going to show you where it is in the graph. So let's, let's put that graph up for them, Tina. As you see on the left side of the graph, it starts out with the loss or the hurt. Pretty much synonymous. Normally, if something pains you, it's because a loss, a loss is involved. And so when this loss comes, and as I told you, grief takes you through a, a, a laundry list of emotions. And we hate it because we don't want to experience those emotions. But I keep trying to urge you and encourage you, let the emotions have their day. Let the emotions be processed through you because the more you try to deny them, the more you give them control. 
And so your expression of emotions is allowing them express, is allowing them to exit out of your life. They got to have their moment. And, and you got to understand something about emotion. They're trying to tell you something. They're always trying to teach you something. And so the quicker you're willing to allow them to teach you something, the quicker they release you. They will release you. Now, looking at the graph, normally when the loss occurs, the first thing that hits you is the shock of it. It's shock because your life has experienced an interruption. Loss. Loss is like having this, having this bridge you're going across, then all of a sudden part of the bridge collapsed because we were flowing in this thing and poof. And now my life has been interrupted suddenly and my system is shocked because you, you really are throwing off of, of my routine. And so that's shock. And then the next thing we go in through is your, your mind as fearfully and wonderfully made as it is, it goes into protection mode and you can find yourself numb. And, and, and the, the analogy that I gave you was that your, your mind acts like a surge protector. The job of a surge protector is that whatever you plug into it, normally your computers, uh, your, your, your televisions, it's protecting that thing of value from unsuspected surges of electricity that can come from a storm, that can come from lightning strikes, that can just come from something going on with the power company. And see, that laptop, that smartphone, that television has a limitation on how much electricity it could take at one time. And so what the surge protector does, it detects that this burst of power is coming that can destroy this device. So let me shut it down. Your mind does that too. Because whatever happened, listen, can be so traumatic that your mind goes in protection mode and shuts it down and you don't feel it. Many victims, you know, I, I've, I've had the chance to counsel people who have been, been molested, been, been raped, uh, things that when you just hear about it, it's incredibly traumatic, completely traumatizing, and you often wonder how do you survive that moment? It's this, your mind allows you to go somewhere else. You go numb. Numbness means I don't feel the experience. Because God in his mercy is giving you a chance to, to gather yourself so that you can begin to deal with the reality of it. Because you're still going to have to deal with it. The numbness is not a permanent state. And see, some of us try to make it a permanent state. By, 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 by alcohol, by drugs, by sex. I don't want, because I don't want to feel this, and I've taught you this before, is that, that pain doesn't always, doesn't naturally motivate us to go find solutions to remove the pain. Pain normally motivates us to go find pleasure. Because I, I've got the hurt, I just need to find pleasure that exceeds the hurt so I don't feel the hurt in its full form. And so we still got to we got to migrate through these feelings because at each of these feelings, at each of these junctures, we have a decision to make. If I pull myself out of the process. I normally pull myself into something else that's going to hurt me further and deeper. I hope you all hear that as much as you don't want to go through this because it doesn't feel good. What what it what what you're allowing yourself to enter into normally has worse conditions for you later. And so we get through numbness and then my mind starts to allow me to begin to see my reality. And sometimes I'm still not ready for that. So you find yourself in this place of denial. Here's the place where you can confront it with acceptance. Because deniers said, this, this ain't happening. This, this is not real. I don't believe it. You know, you, you get a phone call that somebody has passed. Shock, 
numbness, things like that. I don't believe it. No, there's no way in the world. There's no way in the world they're gone. Denial or acceptance. Here's where you got to make the decision and go, I can, I'm going to have to accept that. Because you, you stay in denial and you're checking out of life. And you can tell by just that statement that that's not good for you. When you abandon the process, you take yourself to places that leave you worse. And so if I can get there and go, I've got to accept this. Now I feel it. And I'm starting to feel it all. And that's why this next thing says emotional outbursts. I need you to understand that about yourself, but I also need to pe need people who are with you to understand that about you. See, see, you don't need to just understand this this graph for you. You need to understand this graph for the people you love and care for. That when they're going through a loss, you might walk up on them when they're in this stage called emotional outburst, and you got to understand it ain't about you. It's not. It's, it's this overwhelming surge of emotions. And it's better for you to express it so that it can exit than for you to continue to be masters of suppression, tearing up your insides, tearing up your health, tearing up your, your core, destroying your gut health, which will leave you in a worse state later. So it's okay, you should be okay to cry when you lost something of great worth to you, great value to you. It should be okay. Men, kings cry. Men too. Quit, quit asking folks to learn how to suppress. Just be there with them. Quit trying to find something to say to calm them down. You know, I, I hate going to funerals or wakes or, or going to visit somebody who just lost somebody and people patting them, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. Don't do that. Let them cry. Let them cry. Let them get that thing out. Then the next emotion. I'm laughing because it ain't funny, but I'm laughing at me. Anger. Once you accept this thing and you cry because of the pain of it, then you mad. And I chuckled at myself because as God has been teaching me this so I could teach you, the Holy Spirit had told me, said, this, this way you hover sometime. You hover right here. You mad, bro. <laughs> you mad. And I'm like, I, I'm chuckling because I, I, I can see the video in my head. And what's funny is that my vocation and my responsibilities have to continue to go on and I still got to meet with people and do all this kind of stuff. But underneath the surface, guess what? <laughs> <laughs> Some of y'all can relate to that, Kate, because you got to go on with life. You got to be the good pastor, Pastor Jones. And pastors can't, pastors don't, don't supposed to be able to suffer laws. You're supposed to, you know, you got the anointing and God is with you and you ain't ever supposed to be mad or sad or whatever. And so you got to be blessed and highly favored at all times. But underneath the surface, you're like, ooh. -wee. <laughs> and so I've had to learn. Sometimes I have to step away from the vocation so I can be good to me. Because the vocation comes with it, expectations. And sometimes so, so misplaced expectations. As if we somehow became super with the title. And so I can be somewhere to express my frustration. So I can tell God I, I don't think he's handling me right. He's going to win the argument. But i got to express it. And I'll also be, be discerning about relationships that will allow you to tell your truth but also be grateful for those relationships too but uh i'm determined that i won't hover around anger no more i got some more folk out there that do the same thing so we're gonna go and get through this go and be because I, I think this is you know god says be angry but sin not god is saying you're gonna be angry god in that in that verse i really do believe now that god is saying you're gonna go through some stuff some loss. Anger is natural. It is. 
part of the process. But don't sin. That's the part that gets us. Because when I'm angry, I want to do something. A lot of times I want to do something stupid. When you're angry, you, you, you want to transfer this anger to somebody else. Think about how crazy that is. That, that doesn't fix the issue, that, but, but I, I want to put this anger on somebody else. God said, listen, your anger is, is, is normal. It is. You, you lost something. And you lost something that means to you. But don't miss it. Sin means to miss the mark. Don't miss who you are. Don't miss who God is. How about this? Don't miss who those people are to you. Because a lot of times when we, get, when we suffer loss, we start taking it out on people who had nothing to do with it. And then once you get through the anger, now you got this, 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 this damage over here you got to go deal with. Or it might be another loss. Because you might have mishandled them to the degree that they don't even want to really do, deal with you anymore. God said, don't mess up everything else because you're angry. Give yourself the right to cry, to go out in the woods and scream, do whatever you got to do to get that outburst out. But don't get mad and create wounds for others. Does that make sense to you? So, so don't be someone trying to act like you, 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 ain't, you don't get mad, that Christians don't get mad. Come on now. Come on, stop it. Stop it. That's why we have all these secrets, and that's why we have all these issues and addictions, because we're still going to have to deal with the pain. Yeah, I said that. We do. Let's, let's, let's embrace the process so we, we won't be somewhere drinking late at night, smoking late at night, creeping somewhere late at night, doing something while you still love God. And I admit you still love God, but you're trying to deal with the pain. Yeah. That's what proves your, your humanity, proves you're not immortal. <laughs> Embrace the process. And from anger to fear, fear normally comes when, 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 it, when something feels like it's bigger than us. It's beyond your present understanding. I can accept it, but I don't understand. I don't get this. Why did this happen? Why, why couldn't this thing work? I thought I did everything right. Why didn't this relationship work? I, I, I was loving to this person. How could, they, how could they do that to me? So getting past this, to, to, to love again, getting past this, to be a friend again, getting past this just to feel stable again, getting past this to feel secure in myself again, uh, uh, being able to get another job, being able, whatever it is that you lost, you start feeling like the challenge of, the, of this new stuff you got to do for your life. It feels like it's bigger than you. Return, I got to be single again. That's too, man, I'm scared because I, I don't know what's out there. I don't know, I don't know what's in here. Am I making sense? I don't know what's, I don't know what's broken in me. I feel like the, I, the idea of connecting with people, the idea of moving away, the idea of starting over again, that just seems bigger than me. Here comes fear. Here comes fear. And so searching is next. Because searching is searching for meaning. I got to put stuff in their place now. Now that I got this void in my life, I got to reconfigure my life. I got to reconfigure my time. I got to reconfigure my relationships. When you lose, let's, let's say this. Let, let's say you lose a relationship that's near and dear to you. You lose a lot. You lose, you, you, you lose your friend. You, you know, if, you, if, if, you, if your marriage dissolves and you lose a spouse, there's so much you lose in that. That now you got to start readjusting your life, finding meaning of yourself. That's why the next thing is you start to realize the disorganization. You start realizing how out of sorts your life is. Now that I, I, I'm, I miss this person, now that I don't have this church to attend anymore, now that I don't have this job to go to anymore, my life is out of sorts because a key part of it was pulled out. Key part of it was pulled out. And so now, if you hear that, you can, you can start to begin to sense why I have to end up in this place of adjustment. Because I got, I got to pull my life back together. I got to reconfigure my life. And so realizing how scattered your life is, is yeah, panic. Panic. Panic is, 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 is fear pretty much on steroids. I went, I, now, now I'm really scared. Panic is often tied to time. 
I, I feel like I got to get something done. I got to I got to get myself together because here's the thing that's here's the thing about this world. It don't care because you lost something. It don't care. The, the, this world is expecting you to come on, get yourself together. Come on back to work. Come on back to the family. Come on. You need to take care of this. You still got these responsibilities. And so you got all this stuff going on. And, 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 and this fear is now commingled with this, this pressure of time, which creates a panic. Panic is like, I got to get it done. I got to get healthy. I got to I got to get my life together. I got to. Yeah. Yeah. And from there. Guilt. Who do I blame for this? I blame the person I always blame, me. <laughs> I gotta figure out this question right here that so many of us get stuck in. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And truth be told, sometimes that's a healthy question to ask if you come at it from the right perspective. It's a healthy question to ask if you believe that I can fix it. Me and God can fix it. I wanna find out what it is, God. Did, did, I, did I mess this up? Did I mess this relationship up? Did I, did I do dumb stuff to lose this job? Could I have done better? You want to know those answers. But guilt is trying to put you in a place. Guilt basically wants you, wants you to dig your own grave and lay in it. That it's over. Because you are, you are permanently broken. And so you got to get through that thing. And so we're still going through some emotions that we hate. <laughs> but we, we, we getting somewhere. Next is loneliness. Loneliness is a feeling. It feels like nobody gets you. Loneliness is, a, is tied to relationships, meaning it feels like nobody relates to you. Nobody gets you. Nobody understands how hard this is. Nobody understands how devastating the loss was. Nobody understands what, what it did to you because you lost, you lost this family member. Or nobody really understands because you, you, you lost a marriage. And, and, and you feel that way, even though reality says that ain't true. There's a whole bunch of people got a divorce. There's a whole bunch of people that has buried loved ones. But loneliness tries to consume you. And so when you start to feel alone, you start to do stuff to make sure you're alone. That's why isolation comes in. Isolation is behavior. I isolate myself. I take myself away from people. I have to do that, not just feel that. As I feel alone, I'm going to stop going to church. I'm going to stop being around my friends. I'm going to stop being with anybody who wants to encourage me or help me. <laughs> because I feel alone, so I might as well be alone. But now we're starting to move on the upswing. I bet it's surprising to you that depression is on the upswing. Hmm. It is. Depression is me taking myself out of life. D, prefix D is a way, pression, pressure. Taking myself out of the pressures of life. Life applies healthy pressure. Pressures to be relatable, pressures to grow, pressures to be knowledgeable, pressures to be responsible. All those things work together to develop you as a human being. You don't grow without pressure. The absence of pressure would not produce growth. And then we start to see the light. Re-entry troubles. Re-entry. At least I'm trying to stick my foot back in the game. But I feel awkward. I feel awkward because my old world, which I was most familiar with prior to the loss, is gone. But now I'm out here trying to find some missing pieces, trying to find some new interests, or trying to, trying to reveal myself for real. One of the benefits of going through this is that you got enough time to deal with yourself to rediscover yourself. And sometimes you start looking back at the loss and realize, that wasn't even me back then. I had, I had completely become somebody else trying to hold on to something that I should have accepted was over. But the awkwardness is you trying to learn to get your sea legs again, walk back into life. And what surprises you is that you're capable of building new relationships. Y'all see that? You're still attracted. 
And I'm not just talking about physical, I'm talking about who you are, your personality. People still want to hear your conversation. And then you go from there to new strengths. I start to feel good about me again. And so now I've developed new patterns, new routines, new people to call, new places to go. I start filling the gap that the loss left. And once I start filling the gap, this wonderful feeling called hope comes in which means I feel like the outlook of my future is looking, looking much better. So much so that affirmation plays a part, I start talking right to myself. I start feeling good about me and telling myself what I'm capable of. I'm starting to dream again. I'm starting to talk positively to myself because my voice is the greatest voice in my life. And I'm also willing to help other people because I, I begin to recognize where they are in the pattern and I can speak life to them there and encourage them there so I can finally land in this other place of adjustment. So I walk through the valley of the shadow of death to get to this other side where God shows me that my future is still intact. Just has some adjustments. And that's the thing that happened with David. King David was told by God that, listen, this baby's not going to live, sir. This baby's not going to live because of how this baby came about. You shouldn't have been with Bessie, but you shouldn't have been with Uriah's wife. And so there has to be consequences for your sin. And David, being a man of faith, decided he would still seek God. And so we see David in, in the grips of anticipatory grief. He's anticipating the loss because God said it's coming. Several of you have, have, have been in the grips of anticipatory grief when you learn that somebody has a set time to live, uh, or you have a, a date on the calendar for the divorce, or whatever it is, you, you know the loss is coming. And so you start going through the cycle early. David was doing just that. What did it say? In 16 and 17, David inquired of the Lord about the child, and the elders of the household stood beside him trying to get David up off the ground. David would not eat. David was in sackcloth and ashes out there pleading with the Lord, hoping to change God's mind. And then the Bible says on the seventh day the child died. God put seven in there on purpose because seven is the number of completion. Seven says it's over. It's done. Heaven is declaring to David, this one's over, son. It's done. The problem with you and I is that we got some things that we're holding on to that we've been standing in the seventh day for so long. God is trying to tell you, this, this one's over. This is over, but you're not. But if you stick with this, you're over too. If you stay with the dead thing, you're dead too. Because you're not embracing the life that comes after it. That's where the king found himself. And I want you to begin to talk to God about what, what am I holding on to that's in its seventh day? What am I crying over, God, that I should just simply be able to have the courage to say, I can accept that. Because the thing is, and, and we're going to end this with this tonight. My acceptance gets me back to life. It's really that simple. It's that clear. Because God still has a plan for you. God still has a plan for you. God knew this event was going to take place in your life, but he still called you to that expected end, meaning that God has made preparations for you to be able to get through that mountain, around that mountain, and get back on track so that you can look back at the loss as a lesson instead of a permanent indictment. It was not a place that you were to die. It was a place that was going to mature you when you took the lesson out of it. Did you hear that? It was a place that was going to mature you and prepare you for the next leg of your journey once you took the lesson. And, and unfortunately, some lessons come wrapped in barbed wire and broken glass. They hurt. But when they hurt, you're not quick to forget them. And you're not quick to not use them. David understood some things. And so David was able to get through this stuff so much so, listen, that, that when God blessed him with another son, look at that right there. Who blessed him with another son? God. 
See, one of the stories the devil will tell you is that when you go through losses, he'll tell you that God mad at you and, you and it's done for you. God blessed David with another son. God blessed David with a Solomon who became an outstanding addition in that family that will produce Jesus Christ. But see, David had to get past. Here's the part I need you to get before we go home. David had to get to a healthy place so he could raise a Solomon. See, some of us are, 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 are so embracing uh, 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 and holding on to the thing that we should be working our way through, accepting as our reality that, that, that whatever shows up next, you mishandle it. Hmm. You lost this relationship, but there's another person there that could be a tremendous blessing to you, but you're still over here mourning that, and so you mishandled the blessing. Solomon would become such a blessing to the people of Israel that Israel would not be in another battle under Solomon's reign. Their, their, their kingdom, Solomon becomes the wealthiest man uh, of our time, which means that Israel was prosperous. What are you forfeiting? What have we forfeited? Because the blessing was set. In, listen to this. What if your blessing was set in time? Meaning there was a set time for your blessing to show up. Whether you were ready or not. Because you had ample opportunity to get ready. How many things have you, how many things do you think we have missed? That was set to show up this day, this year. And it came but you couldn't even appreciate it nor handle it because you were still holding on to things that you should have already pronounced dead. Hmm. That's what God's trying to get us to do through grief. Let it say it is what it is. Work through those feelings. Work through those adjustments. Find yourself back in the light of day and back on your path of wholeness, healing, deliverance and meeting God at the place he designed for you to meet him at. It's possible, y'all. And I'm hoping somehow, some way, I'm encouraging you like I'm trying to encourage myself. All right. The takeaway for the lesson was we have to realize when reality wins without us believing that our expected end has now been canceled. Acceptance of reality doesn't mean that God will not get us to our expected end. It means that God is getting ready to reveal another route to our destiny. Listen, this is the part I like. All while healing our souls. All things still work together for our good, even these painful losses. And so these last four words are an invitation for you, brothers and sisters. Grieve, brother. It's okay. Grieve, sister. It's okay. Not only is it okay, it's necessary. Before we let you go tonight, I want to extend an opportunity for salvation. The greatest gift that God has given us to purge us and to make us his. You know you need him. So right there in the privacy of your home, right there in the privacy of your car, wherever you are watching this, I want you to give God a yes. And allow the beginnings of your healing to start tonight. If you're ready, come on, repeat after me. Say, Father, thank you for Jesus. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And because of my confession and because of my faith, the Bible tells me I'm saved. Holy Spirit. Come live inside of me. Heal me. Show me a preview of the life I can live if I would just heal. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I also want to give you an opportunity to sow into this ministry so we can keep doing what we do. In hopes that really my main thing was what we just did in hopes of getting somebody to say yes to God. And so if you did say yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. So proud of you and so excited about the prospects of your great future. One that was one that's so great that Christ died for you to have it. 
And so for those of you who will and can sow into the ministry, please do so. You see our, our, our options there on the screen. You can uh, go online at our website at cymm.org forward slash give. You can see us out there on the GiveLify app. You can also um, uh, do it through our cash app at dollar sign we are CYM. And you also see there on the screen our mailing address. If you are on Facebook, you can do it straight through Facebook. And our friends on YouTube, thank you all so much for tuning in. And we appreciate you supporting us financially as well. All right, guys. We got another Wednesday night in the bag. I'm glad you tuned in. I'm glad you are committed to your own growth. Take these notes. Meditate on these notes. And oh, yeah, if, if you didn't share, I keep forgetting to tell you all to share. I'm getting older. <laughs> share now. Put it on your page so that when your friend, friends scroll through, uh, they'll, they'll see, see it on the timeline. I think it'll bless them. I think it'll give them some understanding. And all our getting, we need to get understanding. And so thank you all for allowing me to sit here and just calmly talk you through it because I need you to get it more than I need to impress you. All right. Till next time, much love.